This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. According to the Pentagon, a joint American-Iraqi force launched air attacks and home raid operations in al-Sadr city in Baghdad, killing 30 alleged terrorists and arrested 12 others. The city's residents held a funeral procession for their dead, chanting slogans against the U.S. presence in Iraq. سلاح الجو الأمريكي ينتقم من العبوات الخارقة لدروع آلياته التي تسير على أرض العراق. The American warplanes are retaliating against the roadside bombs that have the ability to penetrate their armored vehicles in Iraq. This is a southern city, a stronghold for al-Mahdi army. It has the largest number of population in Baghdad, most of whom are poor. They become accustomed to such military operations like today's air attacks, which allegedly targeted terrorists. The city's residents believe that they are paying the heaviest price for the American air attacks. Watching the funeral processions held for the people killed as a result of these air attacks, it becomes clear how much animosity the local population holds for those who had killed their sons. When Iraqi families wrap the coffins of their dead with the Iraqi flag, it means that they consider them martyrs because they were killed by the occupation's warplanes. The American warplanes' attacks were followed by home raid operations in search for what the Americans allegedly described as a cell linked with Iran. According to the Pentagon, this cell provides explosive devices that have the ability to penetrate American armored vehicles. It is believed that 70 percent of the casualties among the American army in Iraq were caused by these kinds of explosives. The constant attacks against the Sadr city have overshadowed the political process in Baghdad. A Sadr movement, which had suspended its participation in the Iraqi parliament and only returned to it recently, has always condemned such military operations and held the Iraqi government responsible for the destruction caused by them. According to a Sadr movement, the Iraqi government's failure to protect the Iraqis, which it represents, means that it is complacent to the United States air attacks, or that it is unable to stop the American forces from launching attack anywhere in Iraq. After wrapping up a visit to Turkey, Iraq's Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki arrived in Tehran, where security was at the top of his agenda. Al-Maliki's visit comes amidst the worst political crisis rocking the Iraqi government since its formation. Sayyid Salem has the details in the following report. Leaving behind a growing political crisis, Iraq's Prime Minister, Nur al-Maliki, flew to neighboring countries where security was the main topic of discussion. Al-Maliki, who was accompanied by his close ministers, or the remaining members of his cabinet, arrived in Tehran after wrapping up a visit to Ankara. In a meeting with top Iranian officials, al-Maliki discussed ways to restore security in Iraq. The last time al-Maliki visited neighboring Iran was in September 2006, when the Iraqi government was in a better position than it is now. Today, al-Maliki's government is facing a political crisis in Baghdad, where several members of his cabinet have resigned. However, al-Maliki will not discuss this crisis with Tehran, but rather seek its help and urge it to make a more positive approach in Iraq. Iran strongly dismissed allegations that it has supported and trained armed groups in Iraq. Before flying to Tehran, 
Al-Maliki met with Turkish officials to discuss energy and security issues, with the latter given the lion's share of the talks. Turkish leaders asked Al-Maliki to take part in a joint offensive against Kurdish fighters in northern Iraq. At the end of the meeting, Al-Maliki and Turkish officials signed a memorandum of understanding. However, Ankara believes that it will be very difficult for Al-Maliki to meet his end of the bargain due to the deteriorating security and political situations in Iraq. This news comes after 17 ministers, or nearly half of al-Maliki's cabinet, have resigned from the government. Will al-Maliki, who is facing a growing political, economic and security crisis, be able to fix what the war has torn apart in the land of the two rivers? The municipality of Musaib in southern Baghdad has the largest number of displaced families due to violence and forced migration. An official from the Ministry of Displacement and Migration in Babel said that the number of displaced families in Musaib has exceeded 2,400 families. The number of displaced families in all of Babel's municipalities has exceeded 6,000 families, most of whom face difficult living conditions. Dozens of displaced families face deprivation, poverty, diseases, and live amidst piles of garbage. About 600 Iraqi families were forced to leave their homes and relatives for security and economic reasons. They have built their homes out of tin cans amidst piles of garbage and polluted cesspools. Yes, these scenes are from the cradle of civilization. Iraq is rich with resources and has a very fertile land, but its people are dying of hunger, thirst, and suffer from forced migration and violence. Iraqi families are living in swamps and the children are playing with the garbage and drinking the remaining liquid inside disposed bottles. It is as if we have returned to the Middle Ages when people were forced to live wherever they could find water and food. We don't know where this water comes from. We don't know if it is healthy to drink or not. We have to survive. A mother had the courage to vocalize the problems and complained about the difficulty of living in a home made of ten cans in extremely hot weather. It is very hot. We have no shelter from this heat. The only thing we can do is cover ourselves with clothes. We sweat a lot, but we do not have enough water. We barely can get one or two containers of water every three days. The homes of the displaced families cannot be distinguished from the piles of garbage, an obvious result of the situation in Iraq. The withdrawal of the Iraqi Accordance Front from the government and the political vacuum created in the cabinet has caused major problems for Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki. This news comes at a time the nation needs a strong government that is able to achieve security, economic and political viability. Amidst this political crisis, some Iraqi leaders called for a change in Maliki's government. Moreover, some candidates launched political campaigns in preparation for a possible government shake-up. More details are in the following report. Al-Maliki's government faces a political vacuum caused by the withdrawal of two major parties, the Sutter Party and the Iraqi Accordance Front. The move will likely further cripple the embattled National Unity government, especially considering that the Kurdish alliance and the Iraqi coalition are the only two parties left in the cabinet. With this, Al-Maliki will have a rough time running the country, especially considering that the Iraqi parliament is still in summer recess. This news comes at a time when Baghdad must meet political and security benchmarks by September 
September, when the U.S. Army General David Petraeus files his report on the progress of the military surge in Iraq. Meanwhile, some Iraqi leaders, including former Prime Minister Ibrahim Jafari, who is Maliki's number one rival, called for a ministerial change in the government. Among the candidates running for the position of Prime Minister are former Prime Ministers Ibrahim Jafari and Yad Alawi and Vice President Adli Abdel Mahdi, as well as Mahdi Al Hafiz, a secular leader. Al Jafari, who was proposing a national and non sectarian political plan to save the nation, has rallied the support of the Sadr faction, the Dawa Party, and the Iraqi Accordance Front. This news comes after Al Jafari vowed to give the office of the president for the Sunni Arabs. Meanwhile, Iyad Alawi, who enjoys the support of certain political blocs from both Sunnis and Shiites, is seen as a national and secular candidate. However, Alawi is angered by Kurds after he formed an alliance with some opposition tribal leaders against the will of the two major Kurdish parties in northern Iraq. Unlike Alawi, who no longer enjoys the support of the U.S., Abdel Abid al-Mahdi maintained a balanced political relationship with both Tehran and Washington. Abdel Mahdi tried to reach out to the Dawa Party and the Accordance Front by forming a coalition with the first and offering guarantees for the second. Meanwhile, Mahdi al hafiz has started his political campaign early after meeting with the head of the High Religious Authority Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani in order to pave the way for him to run for office. With this, al hafiz declared that he no longer shares the same views with the Iraqi list, which he used to be a member of, but rather supports the idea of a federation. Welcome to the program. Pakistan's President Pervez Musharraf has pulled out of peace talks in the Afghan capital with his counterpart Hamid Karzai. Afghanistan's foreign ministry says his absence will not affect the meeting due to look at regional security issues in the border areas between the two countries. The gathering known as a Loya Durga involves not only the leaders of the two countries but also hundreds of tribal elders from both sides of the border. Mushara phoned Karzai to tell him he's be sending his prime minister instead. From Kabul, here's Dan Nolan. It's not every day you see the Pakistani flag lining the streets of Kabul. They're flying alongside the Afghan flag to welcome delegates to what was billed as the most important meeting in the two nations' troubled history. It's called a jirga, a Pashtun word meaning arbitration. They've been used for centuries in Pashtun culture to settle conflicts and disputes by finding consensus among tribal elders. But in this first ever Pakistan-Afghanistan peace jirga, the main issue is what they call terrorism. I think it will be great help to the world. The world will be a much safer place if uh, terrorists and those who are actually involved in terrorist activities in both countries, uh, if they are not allowed to do it further. At stake is the future of the lawless tribal areas along the Pakistan-Afghan border. Many Afghans believe this area is a breeding ground for both Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Pakistan has always claimed the problem is not on its side of the border. The Jirga was aiming to bring an end to the blame game and find real solutions. So we are going to this Jirga uh, thinking that this terrorism is a threat to Afghanistan and it's a threat to Pakistan and it's an enemy to both. So there won't be any blame game. But Pakistan President Pervez Musharraf's late decision not to come to Kabul, sending his Prime Minister instead, will do little to help find peace. He was with Afghan President Hamid Karzai at the White House when the Jirga was organised. It's believed both leaders were pressured into agreement by the American administration, but it's domestic issues preventing General Musharraf from attending. General Musharraf isn't the only withdrawal from the Jirga here in Kabul. There's reports from Pakistan that up to 100 tribal elders will also boycott the meeting, under pressure from the Taliban. Security checkpoints have already been increased across Kabul to prevent any Taliban attacks, but the chances of finding peace at this Jirga appear slimmer by the day. Dan Nolan, Al Jazeera, Kabul.
شكرا أه سمحت الشيخ اسمح لي ان ابدا مباشره هل تشعر honorable sheikh allow me to begin directly do you feel that iran today is truly threatened by the danger of a military strike or something greater or is this all just being sensationalized by the us media and nothing more امريكي فقط لا اكثر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انتك فعلا انما يتضح هذا اليوم هو أن هناك حرب نفسية تشن In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. What's happening today is a psychological war being waged against Iran. Of course, in this psychological war, the talk is about the isolation that is being imposed by the Security Council. Also, there are denials and confirmations about a possible military campaign against Iran. Will the other side be able to achieve its goals? There is a lot of hesitation in this regard. We've confronted threats and challenges, but I imagine that past experiences prevent the aggressors from being bold enough to carry out an aggression against Iran because Iran has always proven that it has superior capabilities to resist all aggressions. Also, they will sustain losses just as they did in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as other areas such as Lebanon where they attempted different types of aggression. I don't want to deny such possibility. However, I believe that if these threats are followed through, it will come out of ignorance by America or by any other country. من ينشأ من الجهل من قبل أمريكا أو من قبل أي جهة أخرى. سمحت شيخ هناك من يعتقد. Honorable Sheikh, some people believe that whenever the U.S. faces difficulties in Iraq and Afghanistan, its reaction may be unexpected. Or the more the U.S. faces difficulties, the more dangerous it is for Iran. كلما واجه الصعوبات كلما ازداد الخطر على إيران. Of course, in terms of psychology and historical experience, yes, the situation is like this. The dominating superpower, when it finds itself in a tight spot or at a dead end, this power may take irrational initiatives. However, these initiatives will not always be aimed in one direction, but they may be aimed in different directions. I feel that the Americans, the British, their allies and NATO have reached a state of being uprooted from Iraq and Afghanistan. They are in a predicament. They also face problems domestically in their own countries. The elections and public opinion show that there is a dissatisfaction in this regard. For them, initiating another aggression would be the worst way to get out of this predicament. I would consider it suicide. Of course, to us and to them, this suicide will face new problems. However, the outcome will be a real defeat for the aggressors in our region. Also, the region will face some new disasters. In regional news, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in Egypt and currently meeting with President Hosni Mubarak. Back at the, in the Gaza Strip, Israeli troops shot dead two Hamas militants who were approaching the Gaza Strip border. Yuna Tayyara reports. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas meets Egyptian counterpart Hosni Mubarak today to discuss the Middle East peace process. Abbas arrived on Tuesday in the Mediterranean post city of Alexandria for the talks. The meeting follows what Abbas said were positive talks on Monday with Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert in the West Bank city of Jericho. Abbas and Mubarak will also discuss a Middle East peace conference called for by U.S. President George Bush and tentatively set for later this year. On the internal front, Abbas's Fatah party once again rejected any dialogue with Hamas, 
Hazam Al Ahmed, the chief of Fatah's parliamentary bloc, said that the only way out of this crisis was for Hamas to end its occupation of the Gaza Strip and return this territory to the elected and legitimate president Mahmoud Abbas. Ahmed was responding to statements sacked Hamas Premier Ismail Haniya made late Tuesday, in which he offered to give up his post in order for the two warring parties to reconcile. In the latest violence, Israeli troops killed two Palestinian gunmen during a gun battle in the southern Gaza Strip this morning the Israeli army said a patrol on the Israeli side of the Gaza border spotted two armed men on the Gaza side of the fence the soldiers then pursued the two gunmen into Palestinian territory and killed them the two gunmen belonged to Hamas on another note the US Treasury said it had blacklisted one of the largest charitable groups in the Palestinian territories alleging it's a front for Hamas which is branded a terrorist organization by Washington the Treasury said its blacklisting also affected the Al Salah society its director, who it named as Ahmed al-Kurd, the U.S. move cuts the charity off from access to the U.S. financial system. The Treasury said al-Salah had received substantial funding from Middle Eastern countries, including hundreds of thousands of dollars from Kuwaiti donors. The so-called municipality of Jerusalem issued warning notices to many Palestinian residents, threatening to demolish their homes under the pretext that the homes were built without permits. These measures come as Israeli authorities continue to pressure Palestinian residents with the aim of forcing them to leave the holy city. After the Israeli occupation completed constructing the apartheid separation wall around Jerusalem, isolating it from its Islamic and Arab periphery, politically, economically, socially and geographically, it has begun to increase its repression and humiliation measures against the residents in Jerusalem. This is being done to force the Jerusalemites to leave their city. In the past two years, we have noticed a major escalation by Israel. They are affecting everything in the life of Jerusalemites, beginning with plans to demolish homes and ending with confiscating the identity cards. All these acts are aimed at one thing, reducing the Palestinian population in Jerusalem as much as possible. Tens of homes were given demolition notices in Wadi Sul in the Silwan neighborhood in occupied Jerusalem. The justification, which the occupation authorities always use, is building without a permit. The residents of these homes lived through an arduous journey of fines and courts in order to maintain their presence on their land and in their homes. Many times these torturous journeys end with their homes being demolished and they are made to pay for the demolition. We were notified that our home will be demolished and were given an order to evacuate the area. We are suffering here. We pay Israeli taxes, we pay for electricity, water, and two violations. I have a son who is in prison. My house has been threatened with demolition for the past five years. Every six months, I hire an attorney and pay more money. The Israeli government has recently allotted large sums of money to the so-called municipality of Jerusalem to fund the demolition of Jerusalemite homes. These homes will be demolished under Israeli occupation pretexts and justifications. The Israeli objective is to clear vast areas in order to settle extremist settlers there, particularly in the lands that surround the sacred site, which was the first direction for Muslims' prayer and Islam's third holiest site. Khadr Shaheen, Al Alam, occupied Jerusalem. In tonight's lead story, war with Syria is not in the cards, according to Prime Minister Ayoud Olmert. Olmert convened special cabinet-level consultations today to deal with the situation in the north and the preparedness of the home front for another conflict. Olmert said Israel is not planning an attack and neither is Syria. 
He did say, however, that we must prepare for any scenario because someone may mistakenly think that there will be an offensive and a war that no one is interested in. Ministers were briefed on the current situation of the home front and on serious failings revealed in the course of the Second Lebanon War. Diplomatic sources in Jerusalem said Syria had been conveying mixed messages to Israel over the past few weeks. On the one hand, President Bashar al-Assad has called for peace negotiations, but at the same time he's been threatening Israel with the weapon of resistance until the Golan Heights is returned to Syria. Later in the day, the cabinet took up the recommendations of the Shacha Committee on ways of implementing the findings of the Vinograd Commission probing last summer's Lebanon war. Former Chief of Staff Amnon Lipkin Shachak proposed boosting the authority of the National Security Council and setting up an emergency crisis center in the Prime Minister's office. Omert has promised to implement the Shachak recommendations in an effort to improve the government's handling of crisis situations. As we reported earlier, Prime Minister Omert said today that war with Syria is not in the cards. Why then did the Prime Minister convene today's closed ministerial meeting on the situation in the north? IBA's Eli Wagelander put that question to Dr. Alon Liel, former Director General of the Foreign Ministry. Israel has uh, to prepare itself for a war, but uh, I wish that on every two meetings preparing for war, they would have one preparing for peace. And uh, if uh, we'll have only the war cabinet working, we'll get a war. Uh, we have to have a peace cabinet uh, on the possibility of uh, talks with Syria. Uh, we must understand that uh, when everybody is working on an international conference with the Palestinians only, the Syrians will react. And uh, if Syria is signaling it wants to come and the United States says you are not invited, uh, we must uh, face a deterioration. The meeting is taking place at the same time that the Prime Minister is saying out, uh, uh, outright that there is no possibility of war this summer. If there's no possibility, why, does this meet, why do these meetings keep taking place? If uh, the sides would not uh, prepare, they would not uh, work so hard on it. Uh, uh, I see the situation uh, as follows. Uh, the Iranians have an interest to uh, warm up the Israeli-Syrian front. Uh, they are uh, offering uh, weapons to Syria, they are offering financial aid to Syria, and Syria is uh, too weak to refuse it, and uh, doesn't have any alternative in fact. So the stronger this bond will become between Iran and Syria, the bigger will be the chances for peace. So, for, sorry, the bigger will be the chances for war. Uh, somebody from the United States has to travel to Syria and sit on this chair where Ahmadinejad was sitting uh, last month in order to reverse this uh, momentum uh, that is strengthening the Iranian-Syrian alliance. Do you think that there's a danger of war with Syria soon? Of course. I think that the window of opportunity we have for peace will close in few months. Uh, once this Iranian-Syrian alliance will become irreversible. You were involved in talks with Syrians. Do you feel that the progress that you made on issues are now dead? No, I don't think so. I think that two months ago, uh, the Israeli government realized that there is an opportunity. Uh, but uh, Washington, unfortunately, uh, has blocked this road uh, by saying it is not joining uh, the talks. And Syria cannot sit only with Israel because it needs the Americans in order to get rid of the Iranians. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation. 
the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.